self-admitting person who really is sometimes addicted to documentaries and goofy knowledge that probably will never ever be used in my life uh, for a long time. I can absorb things that, that have no rele- really no relevance to everyday life and then be able to spout them out in like some weird situation where they actually arise. Um, I watched, I think it was like a half an hour YouTube video over counterfeit money counterfeit currency, not because I wanted to print my own, just because it looked interesting and it was something different. Uh, For a lot of my life, I wanted to be the exception to the rule and I wanted my life to look different than other Christians and I wanted my life to to have one foot in the world and one foot in church and then I realized real fast that that doesn't happen, um, successfully anyway. I loved Alex's sermon this last week on... uh, when he was talking about, you know, the most vulnerable place when the battle starts is on top of the wall or on the fence, not a good place to be. Um, but as I'm watching this, this YouTube documentary over counterfeit money, um, this guy says something that rings super true. And they're asking him, they're like, so, oh, I'm sure you've studied like all sorts of counterfeit bills, right? I'm sure you've looked at every single one and blah, 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 blah. And he says, no, never, ever, ever, ever have I studied a counterfeit bill. I know the real thing front, back, and inside out. He said, 99 times out of 100, I can reach and touch it I can touch it and know that it's fake. I don't even have to look at it. He's like, I know the font 
of the serial numbers. I know what the water markings are. I know what, what color of green, what color of ink and dye that they use. I don't need a marker. I don't need anything like that. I can just, most of the time he can just touch it and feel by the weight of the bill, whether it's real or not. And this is one of those obscure things that now rings true in my life. Think about it. We're sold a bill of lies every single day from we wake up and we go to sleep. Not only from our, the culture and our media and things like that, but we're sold it from ourselves, our own internal thoughts. I watched an obscure video on this psychologist that did a risk assessment analysis and how off our risk assessment of our own life and the choices that we make based on a risk assessment are awful because we base them 99% of the time, we base them out of fear. So even when we're trying to evaluate what's good and bad for our lives, we're not even good at it. It's like, it's scientific knowledge, it's known, but we still fall for it, we still do it, right? And I was thinking about that, so, what is it? We need to know the truth, front, back, and inside out. We need to know the gospel. We need to know what Jesus looks like. We need to know what the death and resurrection looks like because when the evil comes knocking, they're not kicking down the door. They're, they're knocking in this, almost the same way that Jesus knocks. And they're, and they're telling you something that kind of what Jesus said, but a little bit different. It sounds nice because they've changed definitions to words. The world will trick you. Think about the first lie in the garden. The devil said, you know what? Go ahead and eat of this tree. You're surely not going to die. Hey, but you're going to be like God. If you eat this, you're going to know what God knows, and you're going to be like God. What an awful lie that we still continue. What is it? it sounds just like what we're taught today. Love yourself, lean on your own understanding, have your own truth, control your own destiny. That sounds like being God. It's the same lie that was perpetrated to Adam and Eve and now we're still falling after the same thing. Austin talks about how Jesus and words haven't changed in the Bible and amen to that, but guess what? Satan and his lies haven't changed either. Haven't changed a bit. Second Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You could start every sermon with this. Every sermon, and it's relevant. Because if you're in the word of God, I love this. Uh, verse 16, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may thoroughly be equipped for every good work. And I wanna focus on 17, that the man of God may be competent and equipped for every good work, or every servant may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, because any work that you're doing that God isn't telling you to do is not a good work. It's not. If you're doing something that makes you feel good about yourself or number one, it's not a good work. That's a selfish work. That's selfishness. That lie that we believe that Satan perpetrated in the beginning that you are, you, you're gonna be like God and you are gonna be God of your life. And, and, and the new age talks about, I'm God, you're God, we're all God. Right, that's wrong. That's a terrible lie that we believe because it becomes selfish and self-centered. And we know if we filter it through the Bible, we know the Bible says, die to yourself, become less. But it sounds good and feels good, so we believe it. Psalms 119, 105. Your word is a lamp into my feet and a light into my path. And in this sermon day, I'm gonna, we're gonna get into some real, what I call Sunday school verses. And we're gonna put them in a real life con context. And I feel like a lot of sermons and a lot of pastors, a lot of churches, they'll skip over these because we feel like we've grasped the full meaning of it. Have you ever tried to walk in the dark? Now, have you ever tried to walk in the dark while you have a three-year-old child that doesn't clean up after herself? It's terrifying. It's terrifying, if we know how Satan works, if we know how the devil works, he works in a way of setting traps. He doesn't have the power to be omnipresent, 
He doesn't have the power to be all-knowing. He is not equal, one with God. He is not, he is not God's yin and yang. That's not how that works. That's a lie. But he has to set traps. Greed, selfishness, things like that. We gotta fall into these traps. Sexual immorality, we gotta fall into these traps. And, when you, and it's easy to fall into a trap when you can't see it. It's the measure of a good trap is not being able to see it. Ask Indiana Jones, right? But when you light the path and when you can see the trap clear as day, you don't fall into it. You don't buy into the fakeness, the shallowness of the world where it tells you, no, 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 do this, make yourself feel good. Guess what? That's only gonna work for like 120 years guaranteed, right? 100 years maybe. Life expectancy in America is like 75 or 77, depending on which study you look at. So what, you feel good for 77 years? And then what happens in eternity? We know. If you read the Bible, you know. That's what makes you prophetic. Because you know what God has in store for you. And that's why people get upset with Christians a lot of the times, because you seem so sure of yourself. Yeah, pretty sure of myself if I know where I'm going once I die. Makes death a lot less scary, for sure. John 1, uh, John, 1 John 1, 6, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. We lie. If not to ourselves, worse to others. And we lead them down a dark path full of, full of traps and things to snare you and trip you up in your life. The pursuit of things that are not good, working for things that are not good. And we don't know that because we don't know what's real and, real and uh, fake. And maybe the next step that you need to take in your life is to understand that this whole book front to back is 100% real and the only thing that you need to know when it comes to your life. Ephesians tells us there's nothing new under the sun. The devil hasn't changed his game plan since man was created. The evil one has been and is coming and it's going to be easy for people to trip up on it. If we read in Revelation, if you read like uh, 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 the end times, right? The beast is going to suffer a moral wound, go away for a few days and come back. What's that sound like? It sounds like a pseudo version of what Jesus did. It's a small lie to get people to believe that he's some immortal, immortal thing that can take down God and he preaches things that, are, that scratches the, itches of the, the itching ears that Jesus refers to, that uh, Paul refers to in 2 Timothy. He's gonna preach this one world religion where it sounds great and everybody love everybody and you can be immortal and you're gonna be more than human. You're gonna be human 2.0 but it's not gonna be real, it's not, it's not the savior. And a lot of people are gonna fall victim to that. Why? Because they don't know the truth. They didn't study God's word and understand it. So as soon as they were handed a lie, they knew it was a lie. They could feel it. They didn't even need to read it or invest any time in it. They could feel it. As soon as you touch it, you know it's a lie. Why? Because you know God's word. So I think the next step in our lives, and I love the Bible because it gives us a list of things that we can, we can armor up. Armor of God, my daughter is obsessed with that song right now. They sing it over in the Sunday school and it's like on my frequently played like Google music. Like I pull up my Google music in my car and then like armor of God, this like, it's a really catchy song. So you should probably check it out sometime. But it, it's really funny. And my, and my daughter knows like the shield of faith. You know, she's like doing all the motions with it and the breastplate of righteousness. And as she's singing, I'm like, that wasn't, that, that set of verses wasn't for like five-year-old kids, three-year-old kids. That, that, that's, got some, that's got some juice to it. That's gotta have something more to it. And I was thinking about, and what started me on it was the helmet of salvation. 
right? And this helmet of salvation, and I, and I could refer to a few verses that I knew that kind of backed up why salvation would be over, our head, over my head. So it got me into this study. And I was just thinking about it like, have you guys, do you guys know what wish.com is? You know, wish, it's like cheap off-brand stuff. It's like counterfeit. It's like as close to the, as, as close as possible for like, a hunt, like 99% discount. You think it's real? I call it wish.com because you wish it was real because it's not gonna give you anything that you want. Um, I couldn't imagine, and I was thinking about, I couldn't imagine putting on the armor of, of the world. That's like buying, that's like buying like the plastic helmet with the dragon on it. You got as a kid with the plastic sword. To, and if you didn't even hit your friends with it, but if you waved it too hard, it like bent. It was like, and it'd like fall over. Yeah, I couldn't imagine going into a battle with that kind of armor on. So fake, so fake. But I love the armor of God. And, and we're gonna go through that right now. Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. And I like how it never leaves out that we need to do it in its fullness. Not just the boots, not just the helmet, not just the breastplate, not just like two of the few. No, all of it. You've got to put all of it on. Because you're going to be left exposed, right? We're going to be left exposed if we don't put the whole armor of God on. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. I love that part because this earth was made to be heavenly. The original creation of this earth and what its purpose was and what Adam and Eve's jobs were was heavenly. Think about it in, in, in the Lord's prayer, on earth as it is in heaven. That's what man's job was to do, was to rule earth like God rules heaven. That was the job. This place is meant to be heavenly, but we have the fall and are saved. We have another fall and we are saved again and again and again and again. And then Jesus bails us out for eternity. Praise the Lord. Amen. Forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, and it does not leave it out again. It says the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all that, stand firm. 14. We're going to break down some of these pieces of armor here. In 14, therefore, having steadfastened on the belt of truth, and I love it. I love the belt of truth. You know, it's funny. Um, if your pants are too big and you don't have a belt on, it's going to be pretty embarrassing. And then back in, in, in the time when they wrote this, the belt, they would use the belt to tuck the tunic in to where they could run faster. They'd tuck their tunic in their belt and they'd, stra and they'd strap their belt. And think about it. What else is hanging off the belt? The sword's hanging off the belt. Everything's hanging off the belt. And we've been talking about truth in the beginning of this sermon. And if you don't have truth in your life, I like to, I immediately go to the, the saying in my hand, you're caught with your pants down. You tell enough lies, little white lies, one gets exposed and then it's like dominoes. And then you're at the end like, uh, uh, sorry. John 8, 32, and I, I love God's word because it, it backs itself up all the time. And you can find verses that refer to each one of these pieces of armor. You can find verses that support that you need to put this stuff on and you need to equip yourself with it every day so you're not fooled. John 8, 32, and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. If you know that you can run and take off and you're, and you're not gonna lose stuff off of your, you're not gonna lose your sword and, and your tunic's not even come untucked or your, your pants are gonna fall down around your ankles, you're free. You feel secure. You're secured by the truth. People can lie to you all they want and it bounces off. No, thank you. I've got mine. And it comes from the only one that can give it, the true truth giver, the moral giver of God. In 14.2, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, 
doing the opposite of bad, being upright, being set apart. It's what guards your heart. When you set yourself apart from the things the world is doing, you are guarded. You guard yourself from those temptations. You know, you can be preaching to people about things. I was, I was um, at a meeting here at the church and, and somebody gave a little bit of their testimony and they talked about a situation they could now reinsert themselves in. And I was just like, yes. That's exactly what God wants for us. Cause we, you know, there are benefits and I'll, and I'll admit this, there are benefits to other religions in the world. Shallow benefits, but benefits nonetheless. There are benefits to 12-step programs. There are benefits to meditation and keeping yourself away from, say, certain substances or whatever the case may be. They might be able to get you off that, but you're still a slave to it. And what I love about Christianity is you can be a recovering alcoholic and you can love God and maybe he saved you from that, but guess what? You don't, you don't live with the spirit of fear and timidity. You should be able to still, you know, maybe at one point in your life when you've got some spiritual maturity, you can walk back into that bar and you can, and you can preach to those guys who struggle with that. You're not gonna continue to be a slave to whatever it is that you gave your life over to. God changes you completely. It's a transformation process. It's not gonna happen overnight. But that encouraged me, man. That fired me up to hear uh, that man share that. That that gave me so much encouragement. Second Timothy uh, two twenty two. So flee the youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. The breastplate guards our heart. Because if our heart doesn't change, this isn't going to change. If we don't start caring about things, we're never going to start thinking about them differently. Romans 1.17, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith, for faith, as it is written, the, righteousness, the righteous shall live by faith. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith. You know, you're pretty, if you've got, a, if you've got a, a bulletproof vest on, if you've got some armor over your vital organs, feeling pretty invincible, right? It's easy to have faith when you're righteous. When you're living in righteousness, when you're walking in righteousness, it's easier. I'm not gonna say it's always easy, I'm not gonna lie to you. We have, I've already done my sermon on get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you it's gonna be easy all the time. But when, you've, when you're living in righteousness, it's, it's, it's almost a second nature to walk up to somebody and be like, hey, you know about Christ, man? When you're not walking in the darkness, when you're fellowshipping with, fellowshipping with him and you're walking in righteousness, you're walking in the light, it's easy to have faith. This little side story, there's two guys in Kentucky that were arrested this last week, it's really funny. Because I'm sure you wouldn't do this with body armor you bought from Wish. But two guys in Kentucky arrested uh, allegedly, you know, prove it, innocent until proven guilty, and I don't know their court date, uh, allegedly were uh, under the influence and were taking turns shooting each other in the body armor that they had on. It was like, bang, psh, psh, psh. And I was like, man, only in Kentucky, right? Or Western Nebraska, maybe, all right? I couldn't believe that. I just like, you were shooting, you were taking turns. I, I, I mean, you were taking turns shooting each other in, in your body armor. That, that's a lot of faith. That's a lot of faith in what you got there, buddy, for sure. Moving on, verse 15. And the shoes for your feet, having put, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Shoes. I worked for Nike for a little bit, and there's, there's one thing. Jordan shoes are probably the most counterfeited shoes ever because... I don't know, well, I don't know why they're so expensive. They just released the exact same thing they released in the 80s and the 90s, and they make it a different color and charge you $200 for it. But whatever, it's got some sort of value in our culture. So the one way you can, you can determine whether a Jordan shoe is fake or not is look at the tag, and you can literally type in on Google the serial number, and it'll pull up the shoe. And if the colors are mismatching, it's a fake. Counterfeit, not the real thing. Makes a $250 to $500 shoe worthless. As the shoes on your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel, 
if you got a fate, if you're living by a fake gospel, if you're living by the standard of loving yourself and making sure you've got enough me time to recharge the battery and do all those things, and you don't live by faith and and letting God rise you up on wings of eagle, uh, wings like eagles because you don't run until you're weary, you don't walk until you faint. John 10, 28 through 30, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand. I and the father are one. If you believe in the gospel of Jesus and you believe in this, it is easier to have the position in Isaiah 6, 8. And if we go to Isaiah 6, 8, and I heard the voice of the Lord say, Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. If you live by a fake gospel, if you live by the counterfeit and you're wearing fake shoes, you're not gonna be able to get very far. Not gonna be able to get very far. You're not gonna to wanna to share the gospel. You're not gonna to wanna to be sent. You're not gonna to wanna to move. Verse 16, in all, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Hebrews 11, one. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. If we have faith in God and we're convicted by the things we haven't seen, then the things that happen in our lives, those flaming arrows, those hangups, those shortfalls, the times where we decide to wander off the path and we're in the dark and we fall victim to a trap, victim of our own doing, we fall victims to those traps or, or things happen in our lives, if we have faith in God and knowing what the end is, then it's easy to deflect them. It's easy to absorb the assurance of things hoped for. We all hope for peace. We all hope that our days are gonna go good. Well, guess what? When you have faith in God, the, th the bad things that happen in your day aren't near as bad as they really seem sometimes. And you put them into perspective, we fall for the, well, the most common lies as we're going through these things ourselves. Jesus says, no, we all have fallen short. Encourage one another. Romans 10, 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. And you're not gonna hear it and you're not gonna have faith until you get into the word. Faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I feel like in our culture today, we're almost programmed to make excuses or to talk our way out of things. I love how when you actually get into the truth, how easy the lie is to detect. No, 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 tell me why you're oppressed. Tell me why your life is rough, you know, and then I'll give you the free pass. What does God say? So faith comes from hearing. God says, be still and listen to me. I'm the only one that can give you real peace. I'm the only one that can give you the armor. I can, I'm the only one that can give you eternal life. And then finally in verse 17, uh, verse 17, the first part of 17, and take on the helmet of salvation. Romans 12, two, do not be conformed to the, to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Salvation changes your mind, changes the way you think because your heart has been changed because you took a righteous step in becoming saved and being baptized and you've accepted salvation, your mind is now covered. You look through the world through a different lens. You see it differently. Colossians 3.10, and have, and have put on new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the, after the image of its creator. Helmet of salvation protects your mind. 
in the sword of the Spirit. 17, the second half of 17, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. How do we fight our battles? How do we get through the day? How do we fend things off? What's the offense? God's word. Matthew 10, 34, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. But a sword. And he tells us it's a sword of the spirit that we're not gonna fight off flesh and blood. The battle isn't against each other. We get that confused all the time. That's the bit, one another big lie that, and trap that we fall into. The battle's not against one another. It's against this, this evil darkness. And the only way that you can fight it off, tell it to leave and fend it off is with the word of God and the Holy Spirit stirring in you to understand what this is saying. You know, you'll hear people talk about what Jesus is and, and, and this, this new age religion of like intersectionality where it's everybody love everybody and accept everything. Yeah, it sounds good until you tell me your definition of love. And it doesn't match up with God's. And they tell us, no, Jesus would, Jesus would be okay with this and Jesus would be okay with that. Yeah, he died for it. That's how not okay he was with it. He is willing to hang himself up on the cross so that you could be taken away from it and you could be bailed out of it. Not, that, not so you could, he would be okay with it. And he tells us, do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace. I have come to bring a sword because he's gonna eradicate evil on this earth and new heaven is gonna be placed here. And by one word, like a sword out of his mouth, he will eviscerate the armies of the devil. And we'll have heaven on earth. He didn't come to make peace. Get on his side. As we go to communion uh, this evening, like we do every time that we meet, as we're called to do in the Bible, as Jesus and God calls us to do. Communion is for those who believe. Communion is for those who have faith, have been baptized in the Lord, have taken the righteous steps, have put on the armor of God. And if you have it, and you wanna know what that peace is like, and you wanna know what that armor is, I'd love to pray for you in the back. I'd love to pray over you and have, a, have you accept Jesus and start that transformation. Start building that helmet of salvation. Let's not forget this, Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing the division of the soul and of the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. As we go to communion today, we need to be able to discern the intentions of our heart versus God's heart. What is the true and what, what is the truth and what is the lie? And being able to sniff out the counterfeit truths that are told to us today. How is the Lord gonna empower you in taking your next step in your life to where you can identify these lies and live a life of righteousness and worship and go to small group and give and do the things that it is to be a kingdom builder? Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you tonight as broken and flawed vessels. Thank you for bringing us together this evening to hear your word, to study it, to understand your heart and what you want for us. Lord, we thank you for the word so we can know your character, and why you died for us and why we have the gospel. Lord, we recognize your power. We recognize the power that you have to save us and what you did to save us, not to be okay with our sin, but to get us as far away from it as possible. 
Let us not forget that as we partake in the remembrance of you and what you've done. Lord, bless these people, bless this place, this city, this state, this nation. We recognize your power, your love, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen.